You lie down facing the scorching sun in the middle of the desert, when suddenly you smell something extremely foul. You try to crawl to the source to see if maybe someone there can help you, but all you see is a large hole in the middle of nowhere. You crawl there and stick your head down the hole. You hear something really faint down there, but it's too dark to see anything. Still, the foul smell tickles your nostrils. You turn away in disgust and stand up to get a better view of it. The hole is roughly 100 feet in diameter, with nothing around it. You've been wandering around the desert for days and just ran out of food and water. But far away, you see what looks like a small hut. You walk there for another couple of hours until you reach the outskirts of a village. A local man riding a camel tells you that you're in the Al Mara province in Yemen's eastern region, which is quite close to Oman. He immediately takes you to his mud hut, feeds you, and gives you some water. Feeling refreshed and full, you ask the local about the hole in the desert floor. His eyes sink in and his face grows pale. He grabs you by your sleeve in silence, throws you out of his hut, and slams the door shut. You try to knock on his door once more, but he ignores you. Out ahead is the village market, where you could surely get some answers from people. You head over there, and everyone starts staring at you, as if you're some kind of threat. They sense something's off about you. You put on your hood and make your way to a merchant. While you purchase some food, you ask the seller about the hole, but he refuses to sell you anything. He even pushes you off to the pathway. You make your way to another vendor and ask about the hole. At first, he's reluctant to tell you anything, but after you buy a few items from his shop, he finally concedes. He takes you to a small inn and seats you down. He tells you to keep your voice low when talking about it. He then orders a beverage for you and begins explaining everything he knows about the hole. Legends have it that the well of Barhut, which is in Hadramaut, is a cursed place, a prison for spirits. He claims that any object that goes near it eventually disappears. The server comes back with two refreshing drinks and the man quickly stops talking. As soon as the server leaves, he resumes telling you about the well. The reason why people were avoiding you when you mentioned the well was because it's believed that it brought bad luck to anyone who was near it. They were even able to feel it through you. The man tells you that he doesn't believe in such superstitions, but you want to find out more. At night, you head back to the well to find out if what he said was true. You sit down next to it and concentrate all your senses. It's quiet, nothing but the desert wind brushing against the sand. You hear something that sounds like a whisper coming from the hole, as if calling you to go inside. You get up from your meditation and walk towards the hole. The sound gets louder, but you still can't make anything of it. You stick your head down the hole to listen while holding your breath, but it just sounds like gibberish. The next day, you get some rope and pikes and wait till nightfall to prepare for the next step, descending down the hole. Nighttime comes again, and you set up the ropes and tie them around a tree. You climb down while holding the rope with one hand and a torch with the other, and scale down. You try to breathe through your mouth, but you start to feel like you need to catch deeper breaths the lower you go. The hole is believed to be around 850 feet deep, but you are only able to go down around 20. You didn't expect it to be that deep. You start climbing back up, but you decide to drop the torch into the hole to see how far it goes. You see the flame getting smaller and smaller as it disappears into the darkness. Maybe the man was right, just village folklore about something they can't explain. Scientists claim that the hole is millions of years old and has practically no ventilation. Even though it's been around for such a long time, it remains as mysterious today as it's always been. You're walking in Siberia, looking out for some reindeer, when suddenly you hear a loud explosion from the distance. All of your reindeer scatter around, and you're too much in a frenzy to collect them. You run to the source of the blast and find a huge crater in an area you just passed through. In August 2020, a massive hole was discovered in Siberia, Russia, being around 100 feet deep and around 65 feet wide. The local residents and researchers were stunned to find it there. 
This is the ninth hole documented in the region since 2013. You call the local authorities and a huge team of scientists arrive with weird looking scientific equipment. They claim this crater is the biggest one they've seen so far. Most of these craters were found by accident when people went on non-scientific outings by helicopter or by hunters and herders. Scientists aren't able to wrap their heads around it, but they knew exactly where to start. Permafrost, the thing that covers two-thirds of the whole country's territory. Scientists believe that by studying the permafrost, which contains certain chemicals, we can find out why these craters are popping out. Samples of the craters contain a lot of chemicals, but most notably, methane. Scientists took plenty of samples of the frozen soil from the ground and the ice. They had to descend down the crater to collect most of them. And within two years, these craters end up turning into lakes. According to their studies, the gases, which are mainly made up of methane, accumulate in the upper layers of the permafrost. And they can come both from the deep layers of the Earth and those close to the surface. These gases end up getting trapped in the frost as they accumulate, creating enough pressure to burst through the frozen ground. They claim that these giant holes are a result of the growing temperatures. But that's just one theory. They're still not really sure how they could have formed. But because most of these craters form in remote areas of the Arctic and take years to shape, no one really talks about them. You're fast asleep in the city of Fukuoka, Japan. At around 5 a.m., you hear a loud explosion and feel the ground shake. Japan is prone to earthquakes and tsunamis, so you're prepared for the worst. But the ground isn't rumbling and the building isn't shaking anymore. You check the power and nothing. The whole apartment and neighborhood is completely dark. You look far out from the balcony and see a huge hole in the middle of a five-lane road. You leave the building and join the crowd gathering outside. The hole is about 65 feet deep, and it swallowed everything around it. The traffic lights, sidewalks, and a bus stop are all gone. Even parts of buildings are destroyed, leaving the support beams still standing. The whole subway system is totally dysfunctional, and about 800 households are experiencing blackouts. Even the airport and subway had a bit of it. The local authorities evacuate the entire area in case more sinkholes or gas explosions occur. A few days later, it's all fixed. It only took the Japanese engineers and contractors 48 hours to fill it up and a week to reopen the road to the public. The explosion might have been caused by some construction on a subway line, but the sinkhole is sinking again. People noticed that the road seemed to decline by about three inches in heavy traffic. But with quick maintenance, Japan can fix anything in the fastest way possible. Winning Dean Water Well it may have the title of the deepest hand-dug well in the world, but at first sight, it's just a small covered well you wouldn't even assume that it's there. It's located somewhere close to Brighton and Hove, England. Despite its inconspicuous appearance, it's as deep as the Empire State Building is tall, 1,280 feet straight down into the dark, wet ground. Hey, toss in a penny and make a wish. Wait, it's not a wishing well. Never mind. In the middle of the 19th century, one powerful corporation wanted to build a new workhouse in the area that today is known as Elm Grove. They decided to add it to an industrial school for juveniles as well. It was established for those whose parents were living in the local workhouse, and the aim was to teach the youth the habits of industry. The corporation wanted to provide water for their new institution, so they dug a new well. It was too expensive to bring piped water in from the nearby waterworks. They first wanted to make a 6 feet wide brick-lined well down to about 400 feet. That's where they expected to find the subterranean water table. They were digging for two years, and the shaft went past those depths, but they still didn't find any water. They thought they somehow missed the water source, so they started digging horizontally in four different directions. Even after many hours of work and multiple tunnels in different directions, still nothing. For the next two years, they didn't stop digging. Workers would descend rickety ladders hundreds of feet below the surface, illuminated just by the light of candles. They only used hand tools to load their buckets with soil and pass them up to the surface. Then they would use bricks other workers would send down from above to line the narrow interior. The heat down there was intense. 
They were able to breathe thanks to steam engines that would pump air through pipes down below. After four years of digging, they got to a depth of 1,285 feet. 850 feet of that was below sea level. At that point, the water finally broke through the surface. But as it was coming up, the workers were trying to escape it. It took them 45 minutes to scramble up such a deep shaft. It was expensive, and the company put enormous effort into this well. And they used it for just four years. They abandoned the well in favor of some other, more practical one. A two-foot flint and brick wall is surrounding Woodingding Water Well now. There's also a metal lid covering its top so people wouldn't fall in. It would certainly feel like a journey to the center of the Earth, don't you think? It took a research team 20 years to drill down the Kola Superdeep borehole. This one is over 40,000 feet deep. And despite getting so deep, they never actually reached the mantle. The drill bit was just around one-third of the total way through the crust to the mantle. The heat was insane, which made their work extra hard. Also, their drill got stuck in a rock. So the whole project was finally abandoned in 1989. The Kola Peninsula is located deep in the Arctic Circle. Forests, lakes, snow, and mysterious mists kind of turn this area into a scene from a fairy tale. But in the middle of one crumbling building there, you can see a heavy, rusty metal cap. It's embedded in the concrete floor, as well as secured by a thick, rusty ring of metal bolts. And that's the deepest artificial point on our planet. Bingham Canyon Mine, near Salt Lake City, Utah, is a cool one, too. More people know it as the Kennecott Copper Mine. This mine spans three square miles and produces more copper than all other mines have in our world's history. It was opened at the beginning of the 20th century. It's owned by a large multinational corporation at the moment. Back in 2010, they even declared they'd like to dig the mine further and deepen it for another 300 feet. Bingham Canyon Mine has so many roads. If you could stretch them out into one large road, it would go from Salt Lake City all the way to Denver. There was a massive landslide in April 2013 in this area. So strong, it even caused its own earthquakes. This is the world's deepest open pit mine. So deep, astronauts can see it from orbit. Humans first started digging towards the planet's mantle in the 1960s. That's when American scientists began with something they named Project Mohole. The project got its name after a man who found the boundary between the Earth's mantle and crust. The team didn't drill on land, but on a boat in the ocean. The crust is actually thinner on the ocean floor, although the difficult part is that the crust is the thinnest in areas where the ocean is deepest. Go figure. The researchers were drilling next to the island of Guadalupe, which is off the west coast of Mexico. There's a pit of impressive size and an amazing background story. One man in a drought-ridden part of India has really done the impossible. He dug a well in only 40 days. His wife wasn't allowed to draw water from a well that was in the village because of the caste they belonged to. The man decided to dig a well by himself and give a source of water both to his family and the community. Nobody believed it was possible, but he took his shovel and kept digging day after day before going to work every morning, and later in the evening after he would finish the work. Forty days later, he finally got to the water and proved that some people can sometimes truly stretch their mental and physical limits to achieve what's impossible. Now, imagine how difficult it is to dig a mine by hand. And we're talking about a really big hole mine. They would mine diamonds without any machinery. You can find such a case in South Africa, in the province of Kimberley. A geological pipe there was formed after a breakthrough of gases in the crust of our planet. The pipe was named Kimberlite after the location, just like others in that area. It's in the shape of a pretty large carrot. You can see its upper conical part that narrows as it goes deeper, turning into a vein in the end. 1870 was the time when the diamond fever began in the city of Kimberley. Nearly 50,000 people were mining and extracting more than 20 million tons of soil using only their picks and shovels. The development area was close to 2 million square feet. 
they dug up to 787 feet from 1871 to 1914 and extracted enormous amounts of diamonds, worth more than a billion dollars. This mine has become an artificial lake. Today, it's the most picturesque landmark in this province. Darvaza Crater is one of the world's most unique spots you can find. It's a burning hole people actually made more than 40 years ago. This gaping crater opened up in the desert of Turkmenistan. It was most likely a consequence of a drilling mishap. Geologists then set it on fire on purpose. They were afraid all those nauseous gases would have a negative impact on the environment, so they wanted to burn them off. They also wanted to prevent the spread of methane gas after the ground below the drilling rig collapsed into a cavern. So now we have a 98-foot deep hole. They thought the crater would burn for only a week. Oops, but they were wrong. Thing is, the crater's been burning for over 40 years now. Actually, it's not that bad. The hole on fire eventually turned into a quite popular spot that attracts many tourists. This site looks like the portal to the Earth's core. Hey, maybe you have some marshmallows we can roast? There's not much to do in Antarctica except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals. And you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. It felt like being on a spaceship traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. Even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, and anything else that may have come from the environment. They can practically tell how the climate was during that time. These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. 
In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples, but because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light. But sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So, when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the Earth. The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut, in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks, using a titanium-encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. They had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. They still can't figure it out. But scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling, even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. 
They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Mobile Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the giant crystal cave, AKA the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water, and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, 
there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous, unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now. Who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Russo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. The thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost four miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. Ah, portals. Non-existent, but incredibly fascinating phenomena that we see in sci-fi media all the time. We've tried to invent them and understand how they could work from ancient times. But what if portals were more than just a fantasy? What if they were real and could actually be created and controlled? What if we could manipulate the very fabric of space and time itself? If you think about it, this idea raises a lot of paradoxical questions. For example, what happens if we try to carry the portal through itself? Or what if we squeeze and put two interconnected portals on top of each other? Well, actually, there are no right answers to these questions. Since portals don't actually exist, we don't know how physics works in them. But we can try to imagine what would have happened and answer these questions from the logical point of view. So let's give it a try. Our first mind-boggling question is, what would happen if we took two interconnected portals, like in the portal game, and passed one of them through the other? Starting with the hard one, huh? All right. So we have two portals, the orange one and the blue one. Everything that gets into the orange portal flies out of the blue one and vice versa. They're interconnected. If that's the case, then logically, if the blue portal passes through the orange portal, it has to go out of itself. But is it even possible? And what kind of chaos will something like this create? Theoretically, this is possible, but it will be very strange. 
Since the portals are interconnected, no matter how we turn and move them, the object going through them will always have the same position relative to them. In other words, if we kick the ball into the bottom of the blue portal, it will fly out from the bottom of the orange portal, and so on. Let's note where the top and bottom parts of our portals are so that we don't get too confused. So, what if we try to pass the top of the blue portal through the bottom of the orange one? Then the blue portal will come out of the bottom of itself. It's weird, but that's what should happen logically. And if we keep pushing it further, then the portal will crash into itself and we won't be able to keep going. But if we try to pass the top of one portal through the top of the other, well, prepare for the complete nonsense, the blue portal will start to come out of itself closer to its top. This protruding part falls back into the orange portal, and the blue portal comes out of its protruding part again. In other words, now we have a portal going out of itself, going out of itself. It's quite difficult to understand and keep track of this. In general, if we want to fully pass the blue portal through the orange one, the very end of the blue portal has to finish coming out of itself as it simultaneously disappears into the orange portal. But this is impossible unless the portal is infinitely thin, otherwise it'll get stuck or squeezed or something like that. So even though it's very weird and crazy, this is theoretically possible. The universe is full of surprises, huh? But let's relax our brains a little and move on to the simpler question. What happens if we open the portal in midair? For example, while falling or underwater? In that case, would the water flow out of the portal to our room? Let's start with a mid-air one. Imagine that you're falling in the sky and create a portal right in front of you. It leads to your room, and the exit portal is horizontal. What happens then? In this case, you'll fall into the portal at your usual speed. And even after entering your room, you'll fly forward a little by inertia. But after the teleportation, the forces of gravity will immediately affect you. Because of this, you'll begin to fall to the floor as if in an arc. Eventually, you'll just fall face down on the floor. Not the best outcome, but still better than whatever option you had before. Now, to the underwater example. If you opened a portal under the water, the water would definitely flow out on you. It would press down on the portal with all its weight and would flow until it filled all possible space. Or until the entire ocean would dry up this would have a huge impact on the fish. If you opened a portal to the depths of the ocean, where the pressure is huge, and the water would start pouring into a place where the pressure and temperature are completely different, almost all the local marine life could say bye-bye. In other words, if one day we have portals, please don't do it. Now, get your brain in gear for another paradoxical question. What if portals could be stacked, with one leading to another, and so on? creating a chain of connected spaces. Would that be an infinite loop? A never-ending cycle of teleportation? Sounds like a sci-fi dream come true. But is it really that simple? Unfortunately, the answer is no. What happens in this case depends very much on the portals themselves and where they lead. For example, if one portal connected to a space with low gravity and another to a space with high gravity, imagine what that would do to your body. Actually, it's better not to imagine. But that's not all. If we do somehow create a chain of portals, it will lead to great instability or even collapse of these spaces. In short, the consequences will be unpredictable. However, all of these scenarios are just theoretical as portals are a work of fiction. It's difficult to make a scientifically and logically accurate prediction of what would happen in these situations. The next question is, what if you could teleport into a moving object, like a car or a plane? Sounds scary already, doesn't it? Hold on tight, we're about to break the laws of physics. First, let's talk about momentum. When an object is moving, it's got a certain velocity and, you guessed it, momentum. This means, according to the law of conservation of momentum, the total momentum of a system stays the same unless an outside force comes into play. But what happens when we teleport a person into a moving car or a plane? Well, that's a sudden change in the object's mass and therefore its momentum. 
This change in momentum can cause the car or plane to go haywire, potentially resulting in a crash or, at the very least, a seriously bumpy ride. And let's not forget about the shockwave that comes with suddenly materializing in a moving vehicle. It's safe to say things could get pretty nasty. So, again, if we ever get portals, please don't try this at home. And here comes the final question. Let's take one physics mystery and combine it with another. What if you could portal into and out of a black hole? Entering a black hole is incredibly dangerous, to say the least. It may end really badly even for an object traveling at the speed of light. The intense gravitational forces near a black hole can cause objects to be stretched and distorted into some crazy shapes. This is a process known as spaghettification, which is a really scientific term, by the way. And don't forget about the intense gravitational forces which cause the laws of physics as we know them to break down. In other words, your little portal experiment would have some catastrophic effects. In short, you would be spaghettified before you could even say, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. So, there you go, folks. The thought experiments about portals are a fun and imaginative way to explore the limits of our current understanding of physics and what could be possible in the future. While the scenarios we discussed are purely hypothetical and not based on any actual science, they still give us a glimpse of fantastical possibilities of the world with portals.